All right, let's get started with real-time prediction with machine learning and the data transform with Red Panda. Perfect, everybody. So before I dive deep into um, the topics, I know you probably want to know a little bit about me before. I don't know if you're curious about it, but I've been in this industry for uh, almost 20 years. And I've been, I started with, you know, doing a bunch of, you know, Java EEs and SOA at the time was doing a lot of integration stuff. Um, and then I moved on to work with uh, Red Hat at the time I was doing a bunch of JBoss. And then at that time I was doing a bunch of like integration work. I don't know if you still remember the Apache Camel. So I was doing a lot of work on the Apache Camel. Um, if you go to my YouTube channel, there's a bunch of Apache Camel content on top of that as well. And then I slowly moved on to do a lot of things, uh, deploying camels on top of Kubernetes. So I have done a bunch of content on Kubernetes. Now I am with Red Panda because um, I believe um, there's going to be a lot more use cases and a lot, a lot more system that will be more relying more and more on the real-time data. That's why we say, you know, data is live. It's moving. It's constantly changing. So that I'm working with Red Panda trying to get the... Um, to play with the latest and greatest technology. So that's where I am right now. And for today, we'll be doing the little bit of the uh, like overviews and the basic ideas of how I came up with things. And then we'll dive into the demo I built for a real-time machine learning demo that I built for, uh, with Red Panda Data Transforms. So that's gonna be, uh, that would be that. And then uh, without further ado, well, before we dive into that, I wanna do some shameless plug on, if you don't know what Red Panda is, uh, it's it's a very it's a it's an implementation re-implementation of Kafka. So I don't know if you know Kafka. Kafka is a uh, th those is a streaming data platform. So both Red Panda and Kafka are a data streaming platform that allows you to ingest large volume of data um, at the similar, at the same time where it will be able to handle large amount of load um, with ability to scale up um, to handle more loads if needed and then to to lock everything down so you don't lose any data. And uh, typically you can't really do that with, with databases um, because of some limitations, but with streaming data, data platforms, you can do that. Um, but uh, Kafka was built on top of, um, with was built Java's and Scala, therefore it needs a lot of virtualization layers on top of it because it needs, a, it probably needs a JVM and a page cache to store everything. Um, but with Red Panda, because we we deploy, we, we rewrite everything in C++, that therefore we have a lot direct access to memories and disk. Therefore, uh, we can get a, a, a lot efficient performance out of um, your hardware. And the way that we implement the whole CPU architecture, we did a Thripper core, so we, uh, we tell the CPU what to do instead of leaving the operating system to do. So there's gonna be a lot less contact switching happens. Uh, so there's a lot, a lot less caching in and out from your CPU layer. So it's gonna be a lot more efficient in terms of you know, handling loads. And that's what we are. Shameless plug, but no, just want to let you know. So let's dive into the techno uh, the topics today. So I just wanted you to think about um, building applications with AIs. I know this AI term has been you know over flooded the social medias, and I I think everybody's kind of quite sick of it already. But I think it's important to kind of think about how you would build application with an AI. So normally with um, an app application, what you do is you would either embed a, a to, in today's world, what people would think about, you know, building a, an application with AI is either embed a large language model in their server or in the machine that they're running with the applications. So when the when um, an inputs coming from a customers or other system, it just passed along that question to this uh, large machine, a large language model. This and then this model will then, you know, process and then provide the information back to your. Um, the, the original uh, request for source, right? So that's how people will build it. So the large language model either exists in your local machines or it's it's some kind of services out there. It's like open like open AI, so you just call out of it, right? So that's how will you would write an application today. But I don't know if you remember this. So well, so I did this talk a few times. Um, but when I first write it, I saw this really cool presentation that Humane AI Pin did. Um, so what they did is um, they built this really cool um, gadget where it basically what it does is nothing different from what I just mentioned. So they have this hardware, they wrote an application. This application talks to a large language model externally, right? And it will give you answers. 
on top of that, they gave you some really nice stuff that on top of it, so you can interact with it. So during the time when they did the product launch, they were asking a questions about the Eclipse, and obviously it will give you an answer. But the problem is the answer was wrong, was incorrect. Um, so it's probably not the best thing to present in your product launch, right? So not so cool, right? Um, so you, people to start to know people when you know when it gets more mature into you know adopting these large language model people now kind of see their downside of you know embedding with those uh, embedding with those like language models right some of them would be coming from you know performance problem obviously you can't really embed a large language model in a sub small gadget like that so it requires internet access or any other access to actually do that and then the you know the, the you're not gonna have that and it's gonna be a little bit slower. It's not gonna be like as instance of like giving you answers right away because it needs a lot of time to process everything. So the performance is gonna be a problem. And then unpredictable results because you don't you don't know how the, what well, you do know, but it's, it's really hard to predict what the, the large language model would provide as an answer. Would that be correct? Would that be, and how does how does the how does the language model com comes up with you know combining all these answers, processes these answers back to you? It's unpredictable. It could be incorrect, right? So something must be done with this problem. And a lot of the large language models now are very text based, so it's really it's really hard um, to provide some kind of more of a more. Uh, it's really hard to provide a more multimedia type of information spec. And to be honest with you, like um, customize, customize your large language model with a very small data set is going to be a little bit difficult because you know people talk about and tuning your large language model, but with a small data sets, I don't think it's gonna make a lot of difference. Um, and it's gonna cost you a lot of money running the large language model, right? Because, you know, think about the number of GPUs you need to buy, the machines, how powerful these is to power just one single question. The amount of like, you know, even just consuming electricity that you're gonna use to just come up with one answers, it is going to become a very expensive thing to do, right? So when we think about building a actual AI innovation, I think today's our job as a, normal developers, not like the geniuses out there who's building the large, large, large language models. I think our job is to think about how do we better use these tools to make our system perform better? And, you know, how do we make it fit on what our day-to-day -day needs? And how does it, how do we provide a, a system that's more efficient and better to use, right? So that is the questions I've been thinking. And that is why I came up with a couple of things that's needed and today we're just gonna cover one part of it, but I will show you some work that some examples that I've done before as well. Um, so one thing about low, large language model is that you need to give it a context, right? That's why Reg, um, it's so retrieval augmented generative AI has become so popular is because it gives the large language model a context. So basically what it means that is it gives, it allows you to give a context um, a, a framing area of information to LLMs, telling them that, hey, don't answer the questions based on these contexts. Don't ex don't over generate, don't overthink that. Just provide answers based on the context I give you and that's it. Don't go beyond that, right? So you would get a more, much more predictable answers. Hopefully they're right. <laughs> not, not always, but hopefully they're right. Um, I'm, I'm doing that because uh, we're trying to develop this really cool um, really cool tool where it was going to help us to generate, you know, our COI tooling, you know, just generate a command line for our COI toolings. It's, it's getting it, it's getting it there. It's, it's getting it right, but not, not always. Right. So there's always going to be like some kind of errors, but I think it's getting better. And then fine tune the LLMs. I don't know how good finding LLM is going to be, um, but I think it's best to, if you have the resource, if you have the time, you can fine tune it to the way that it will run a little bit more efficient. So therefore you get your answers. But I think also people underestimate the whole, you know, machine learning model we've been doing for the past 10 years, right? Because this AI, this new AI thing was not new. We've been doing, like, we've doing model, we've been doing modeling for, for a while already, right? It was called machine learning um, AI, right? At the time. So I think it's still valuable to produce and customize your own model because they will be more tailored, more efficient on some 
of the work that your system needs to provide, right? Large language models are good for natural language processing, you know, all these unstructured data. But if we're talking about, you know, like real processing of, you know, of, you know, if, if I want to just get some numbers out of things, maybe a model is more suitable for just for that instead of, you know, going through a large language model and then doing all that um, calculations and giving the answers. I think the world, the now that to build a better system is to have them all together. Um, so I want to show a little bit of a demo th that I did. So let's take a, so I want to, before we dive into the machine learning part of the story, I want to take a look at the LLMs and think about, because I think from our perspective, from Red Panda's perspective, we're constantly thinking about how do we bring in real-time data to the AI world. One of the things that you can do um, with uh, this large language models and reg is to build a system that is more flexible, that is more in real time and more scalable. So how do we achieve that? So one thing we can do is do something something called event-driven architecture, which is totally not new. We've been doing that forever since I think even ever before, even since the SOA time, we've been trying to you know, break out all the modules, very similar ideas. But at this time, we're breaking out our, our uh, models into different smaller chunks of services, microservices, whatever you want to call it. So whenever there is a events or information coming into your system, we can build multiple applications that runs multiple uh, runs different models, different large language models or different services with models or a rack services out there, right? So what this benefit is that you can actually um, simultaneously call these services and they can run the results at the same time um, without interfering with each other unless they're depending on each other for the previous results, but not very rarely the case. So you can have them do all different things and then combine them all together um, by you know aggregating all the, the results they're generating from and then provide the information back. One of the benefits is that you get this flexibility in architecture where you can deploy multiple different models. I know we have so many different choices model today, right? Like there's uh, Olama 3 just came out, like the free open source Olama from Facebook, right? They're, they're, that's awesome because I'm I haven't I haven't tested I haven't tested that one yet, but I'm dying to do that. Uh, maybe I'll do it today later this week, but I think it's going to be very fun and changing. Um, hopefully the smaller model that they provide will be very efficient to run on my machine. Um, but all that, so you can actually test on different um, services and microservices and then see which one works for you and then just switch it and then just redirect your traffic to that particular service and then just shut down the others. So you get that flexibility. And that same thing applies to, you know, like rolling out a new services, right? You can do a, a, do a canary release um, or you can do an A-B testing before you do the whole thing, you know, with all this flexibility built into your system. So you get a more easy, uh, more, much more flexible way of providing your services um, based on um, what you're providing. So I built a, so this is some work that I did uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I built a system. Uh, so this is like a system. This is like a, a really fun demo that I did. So basically what I did is I have RPG games. You know, all these different RPG games, they have different characters and I call them NPCs, right? Because they're, they're just like, you know, computer characters where they just answer very simple questions. So my idea is that if we can power these, these characters with a language model, they can chat with you. So you can have like really cool, you know, chats, um, like information, you can have the actual conversation with this character. So it enhance the world building thing. Sorry, I'm a gamer, so I want to build something something like that. That's cool. So what I did was I created a couple of different um, services. I know it could be a little bit confusing right here, but basically what you see is I have an application that I wrote in Langchain, and I have another application that I wrote uh, with, um, with uh, AWS Bedrock. And basically what they did, very similar, but was just chaining up a multiple um, services that is up, chaining up, uh, chaining up uh, to Bedrock. Um, I think at this time I was using, I was using Olama and then Clay, um, depending on which services they're using. Um, so they're using it to chat. So I have two different services running and they're backing my stuff up. 
So, and that's what I did. And the way that it receives information is that it receives information. This is a node, node, node application, right? And when I when the user gets to input um, a phrase, how are you? And this gets sent into a topic. So I have a multiple topics that does different things. I have a topic that kind of just receives information from my front end. And then I have a delegator. This delegator um, delegates information um, to, uh, to different places. And then it delegates it to different topics. So I'm delegating it to an MPC one, which is asking, how are you? And what happens is then it will then um, go to one of my applications and then this applications will then interact with, um, at this point, because I'm running locally, it's interacting with Olama, but at the one that I did was interacting with Bedrock and it will then provide answers um, back to my front end, which is having a information, uh, having a, um, having a uh, actual conversations with me. So I, so what I did, this is like the first model I plugged in. So what if I want to add another character? So what I did is I just created another, another topics and this topics and, and the delegator just resends, reroute the information into this particular topic, right? So when I do another conversation with the second character, it will then talk to, where is it? Why is it coming up? Uh, talk to the other service, right? And this other service then will then provide, um, and this one interacts with the other one, which gives information back. And I, what I didn't dive into was the, the, um, the code that I wrote that um, does the, uh, some some of the rag information. So what I did, this is a LangChain application. But what I did was I was loading some of the data. So I wrote a, a huge story back backend story about these heroes, and that gets loaded into into the uh into the into the into the uh what is it my applications and then sent into my um into my large language models and then um, and then everything gets suggested and placed together and then get, and then the, the answers gets generated after that and you can also see that i have a prompt here and so the prompt the prompt is happening here so i'm asking some questions and giving it some backgrounds and then this is the local um models that i'm calling and that is exactly what i did and then for those of you who are interested in the um in the reroute Basically, what I did was very simple. So I was looking at the message. Remember the message that I was sending in from, I was receiving from, um, from the front end. I have a very simple message where it kind of just gives me information about who is sending me this information and then what is the message. So based on that message, I have rerouted um, all the the information or the questions to different topics. Therefore, they get picked up by different services. And that's how I did the event-driven architecture. And that's how I did everything, right? So it's this is just a very simple examples that I did, you know, to build that reg, you know, with streaming data. And because this is all happening live, I can quick plug and play and I can quickly stream my data into different models. And instead of doing, you know, traditional, request and response, I get to do a lot more things with, you know, playing around with, you know, adding more, adding more models into it, aggregating information together. I can do a lot more things here. So just a thoughts for you who wants to build an AI application, who wants to, you know, architect a better uh, architecture for your AI systems, right? So if we think about all the data that is involved in building all these systems, there's a couple of different um, ways the data goes into your your um, your architecture. So basically, the one we've been talking about is the inference layer, right? Where we have you know all the events are you know coming into coming in from you know 
user requests, you know, IoT devices and all that, right? And they're all coming from here. And then these information gets sent to app, app, all the applications. And, and here my application will, you know, talk to models. And these models can be in your internal model registries or somewhere else. And then depends on if you have any external reference data. In this case, I'm adding some reg. So I'm adding in some context. So I'm doing some reg here. So by adding, going to go into a vector database or going to a, a documents, converts everything into, into um, and then also provide it as a context to my model. Um, and then, you know, and then provide information back to um, to the people that ask these questions, right? So that is one way of, you know, how the data flow from, from an inference perspective. But then we have the more traditional machine learning, which is going to be more efficient. You know, this is where, how we've been building all the AI systems before, um, but it was mostly um, done in a way that's in a batch, in a more batch way, more static way, right? So I have a lot of events that goes in here. Then I have, you know, databases collecting all this information, right? And then they get you know, aggregated. Sometimes I have you know, overnight batch pipelines that puts everything maybe into a, a data warehouse. And these data warehouse, then I'll have a bunch of pipelines that comes here and then prepare all the data sets for my machine learning models. And then that gets split into two different types, right? One is testing, one is for um, training. And then you get to train your models. And once you have that, then the models gets created, gets generated, and then your ML ops kicks in. It sends everything over to your model registries where you can you know, store all your models. And then your application can use that model to provide you know, useful um, predictions or useful calculations for, for people. So this is how the kind of the data flows within like your system if you want to build a very smart you know, infrastructure or a system like that. So that's where I see it. But as you can see, there's a lot of, you know, pipeline going on here, right? We have a pipeline that goes in from here, which collects collecting information. And then we have a lot of pipeline that goes in here and a lot more here to generate all the data sets over to your machine learning models, right? We all know like working with, you know, data pipelines can be chaotic, right? Because it's really hard to get your data access and you know, sometimes they're noisy, so you need to clean them up. And then the performance might not be so well. Sometimes you don't have, you don't even know what's coming into the system. You don't even know what's available. And it's really hard to troubleshoot, right? So I, this is like the the um, the pyramid thing that I kind of always want to make sure that we're layering the right place, doing the right thing with the right type of pipelines, right? So I don't think on the top, I don't think we're gonna get rid of batch pipeline whatsoever because I still think that they're useful because if you think about large unstructured data or if you want to produce large volume of data, I don't think you can get away with batch pipelines. It's going to be there forever. Uh, you're going to use it uh, for very large data sets for feeding into your uh, machine learning trainings, right? So you're going to still have that and and then some backfield jobs and all that. You're still not going to get away from that, but they're going to become less and less because everything will be, you know, Will will likely will likely to be um, calculated and then sorted out while they come in. So that's why we want to introduce a lot more like active, you know, streaming pipeline processings before they get into um, a data source. And then micro batch is like is it's it's going to be there for you know like the you know the daily reports which you don't really need like instant information, right? But I, I think real time data is it's it's addictive <laughs> once you are. Once you are used to real-time data, it's really hard to go back to, you know, wait for 10 minutes for to get your results back, right? So, you know, and it's a lot more, a lot more useful. So you're gonna go, still gonna get that, but it's gonna get, going, going to get less. So here in this particular session, this is where we're talking about real-time live streaming pipelines. And if you look at the pyramids, like the majority of the data pipelines is going to be stateless meaning that this is going to be a very short, very simple pipeline that does very mundane things, but it's important things like, you know, filtering um, and then some kind of normalization because they might come, not come in uh, in the format that you want. You might want to do some splitting so that it goes to the right places. You might need to reroute them to different places 
do some quick transformations, you know, masking some like sensitive informations to another system and stuff like that, validating, making sure that they're correct. So you don't have dirty data, right? So do that while it comes in will be very useful. Those kind of things would be more, more stateless um, like pipelines. So you're going to have a lot of that in the real time data streaming pipelines. And then we'll have the stateful ones where this is more goes into the more businessy type of um, processings because they will have meanings. Um, so we're talking about win time window base, you know, those fixed windows or sliding windows. You want to take a look at based on timings and then you want to have more complex event processing. Like because of this, I need to process that or I need to remember the state of the previous uh, calculations in order for me to, to process this information here. So these are all like very um, more, more complex processings, right? So there's going to be two types of them. And today, um, the focus is of the Red Panda Data Transform and the Data Transform that we will be talking today are mostly at the stateless data streaming pipeline um, realm because what we'll be dealing with is a lot of real-time data, raw data coming into the system. And how do we turn this raw data quickly for the machine learning model training? So this is the thing that we do. I know there's a term called feature engineering, right? Trying to get the data to the right data, format of data sets for your machine learnings. That's what we will be doing. So what do we do um, in the Red Panda that we did for data transform? So I don't know if you seen how other data pipelines been doing. So what happens is that when you do a data pipeline, normally what you do is you send it into the broker. There is another pipeline that's running outside of your services, right? And then that gets the information gets passed in, that gets processed. And then once this is this gets processed, it gets sent into another broker. And then the the end services that's actually using the data will claim this information or this data from this broker back to it. So as you can see, like there is a lot of overhead going on with like going over the network, going over like CPU copying and all that. Like it's doing a lot of like um like called data replicate du du duplicates and then a lot of time wasted just to get your data transformed. What if we get rid of that data ping pong and then just did the data pipelines in the broker? So everything will just happen in the broker, no more networks. It just does everything in your computer. Everything will be a lot faster. Wouldn't that be a more ideal for running like those stateless, very quick data transformations and get it ready for your for your machine learning? That is something that um, what we did for data transform. So basically, what we did is uh, we use a web assembly technology. This was built for. Um, uh, mostly for running things in browser. So it's basically, it's it's the operating system itself is a browser. So what happens is that when you write the code, it compiles into a binary where your browser would understand and then it will execute based on what. So you can run your C programs on in the browser. You can run your Python programs in your browser. Basically, that's that. But we took it into another level where you can write your Go. Currently, we support Golang, Rust, and JavaScript. You can write these uh, your data transform logic based using these languages, and we compile your code into something called WebAssembly binary. And this was WebAssembly web assembly binary gets deployed into the broker, and then we use something called a WASI um, interface where you will use that interface to talk to your operating system. So whatever your language that you write will be compiled into a binary. Well, it will use that. Um, to convert that into, uh, it will use that to uh, to process your data and the data gets processed. You read directly from the sections of your memory, do the transformations, and then they write directly into another part of your memory. So it's, it's a very efficient way of getting it done. And for you, it's very easy. Basically what you need to do is for a developer, what they need to do is just initiate the, the, um, the project and then write the data transform logic and then just build it. And it turns that into a web assembly module or binary file. And then you deploy that into, um, into your broker. And the broker, is, you know how many, there's going to be multiple brokers in your cluster, right? So the broker will then you know, deploy all the logic, all, all this, you know, your transforms into all, every single broker in your cluster. And then everybody will have a copy. Every broker will have a copy of your binary. 
and then they can do the um they can do the transformations at the time right i don't know if you under if you know much about the whole um like streaming because streaming it's a little bit difficult because it's a distributed system so when a when you you have a producer trying to write to a topic it doesn't just write to one broker it writes simultaneously to multiple broker but it will write to the leader of a particular petition so your broker your topics gets uh, divided into different petitions and then it will write to that particular petitions so that is why we need to de deploy all the logics into multiple brokers so it will it will um it will re it will process um when it sees the petitions gets activated and it needs to write things on it. So that is how it works. So what is that to do with, you know, machine learning, right? Well, let's take a look at the example. My example is very simple. So it's a very simple machine learning problem. I have a problem. So I want to take a look at if I can build a mod machine learning model, uh, a, a model using machine learning um, to build a model. And then on top of that, I want to do the training, but this time, instead of doing a batch training, I want to train everything in real time and then deploy that machine learning models and then will give, give will, will provide me with real-time predictions. And I am using a, um, a sort of like a food delivery system because, you know, for food delivery system, you want to know your answers right away. You don't want to have like, you know, yesterday's like statistics because the weathers can be wrong and things can be wrong. So you want like immediate, real reflected model to predict how long I'm going to get my food. The informations are raw. The data I'm getting from all these devices, you know, like all these like apps are going to be super raw. All this IoT device is going to be raw, right? So how do I turn this raw data and provide that, sends that over to my machine learning so it can continuously learn uh, from the new data, which is going to provide a very new dynamic model and that gets executed in my application so I get the latest and greatest predicted time. So this is, like, this is not like 100% a real use case, but this is kind of gives you an idea of how I did it. So what I did here is, um, I have a, let me get, a, get rid of this Zoom thing. All right, perfect. So before, like what every single data scientist would do, right? Before they start creating models, what they do is they will probably first go and take a look at what is actually in the data that's coming, right? So basically, oh, oops. Sorry, I can take a look at this. So the data is right here. Okay, this Zoom thing is very annoying. Um, all right, so I, I wanna take a look at the data sets. So now I have a text file, which is giving me like a very small data sets of what everything looks like. So I know coming from these um, gadgets or all these like IoT devices, I'm getting a lot of information. I'm getting a delivery ID, system, delivery person's ID, I'm getting their ages, I'm getting their rates. Their, their ratings and I'm getting the latitude and longitude of the restaurants. And I'm also getting the latitude and latitude of my house and a bunch of information. And that's, last but not least, the very important time taken for, um, for me to get my food. So that's it, right? Um, but there's a question. So how do I predict? How do I make sure I'm doing the right thing, right? So not, one thing I need to take care of is I only get latitude and longitude of the locations. How do I know the distance between the two? Well, there's a lot of, you know, things you can use, but here I'm going to use the easiest uh, easiest way of predicting it, geometry. So we're going to use that geometry where we're going to calculate the, the shortest distance between two points, right? Geometry came in. Um, so here is how I come up with a distance. And then after that, as a data scientist, I want to make sure hey, what are the factors? What are the things that would affect the delivery time? So I was digging in and see, you know, if I, if it's, does it matter? So it looks like the age of the driver is going to be correlate to the, correlate to the time taken for, um, to, for me to get the food. So it feels like the younger this person is, the, um, the faster I'm going to get my food. And as well as I'm taking a look at, you know, if the rating of this particular driver 
or the very person would affect you know the the time it takes for me to actually see the results and it does looks like the better the rating is the faster i'm going to get my food right so the time taken is going to be a lot less with the higher ratings and i'm also going to take a look at the other miscellaneous you know informations about okay so what about like different types of vehicles if i have different snacks if i have ordering different things and they, I don't think they are, they, they have any, there any matters with like that. So, all right. So I know that if I want to build my models, it needs to be like related to either the, um, the, the, uh, what is it? The, uh, the age of my drivers and then it's, or the, um, the rating of my drivers and then the distance of the two locations. And here we're going to use a very simple machine learning uh, we're going to train our machine learning model based on a very simple LSTM natural, you know, neutral network uh, for this particular very simple, you know, mechanism to actually can come up with my models, right? This is what I'm going to use, right? So I'm just loading my information back in and all that. That's all I need to know. But so now I know I, there's only a couple of different parameters I need to submit into my, into my information. So how do I get my data from so it would know to just pro just process the information that I need instead of giving a bunch of data that was given to me, right? Without, without running a batch pipeline. So typically what people would do is that they would go and then, you know, read everything into, into a database and then they would have another pipeline that process everything into a data set so I can start feeding that into my models, right? But actually, I don't have to do that. So what I did is I so all the things I'm I'm oh, I'm sending all my my uh my data from my you know IoT devices into a Red Panda broker. I'm gonna send them into a Python Apple uh, 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 no sorry I'm gonna send that into a raw data a topic right here. So what I am doing here is I'm gonna go ahead and then. I have a producer, right? Okay, so what I am going to do is I am going to start producing some data into my, where is my delivery model, right? Here is my app. And I'm going to start producing, send some data into my Red Panda topic. And then if you go to my topics right here, you're going to see the data are now coming in. As you can see, they're all very raw. So these are all the data I'm getting from, these are all data I'm getting from my devices, but I don't need all of them. So how do I pre-process them in a way that they'll be clean? Um, and then for my data, for my real-time data consumptions, right? So. What I do here is I am now going to stop my producer. And then I am going to do a data transform. So what I can do is I'm going to create that in broker data transformations for myself, right? So I am going to go ahead and then um, do a, uh, what do I do? What I'm going to go and then just init a transform, RPK transform init super fast. So what I'm doing here is I am going to just initiate a project which is going to you know, get me set up with the right um, bootstrap of what the data structure will look like. So if you go ahead and look at the data, the, the file here, you see there's a folder called Superfast Panda. And if you go in here, you see that it has generated a data structure for me. So let me go into my editor and refresh this and I can see it, it creates it for me. So it, it even has a very small like readme file tells me what to do but don't worry this is the file 
that I have for um for you know doing the data transforms. So it kind of gives you like a, a very structure like telling you, hey, this if you want you can if you want just add the data transform logic right here in this particular method and it's going to do the transform. This is basically what it does. So I already have the code written here. Let me just paste it in here. So the code actually does very little things. Remember the, the raw data that was given to us, it has the latitude and the longitude of the location and the destinations. So here I'm also replicating the same thing with what I did with my, my um, and the analysis. Remember that pipeline that we did with, with um, Python. Um, so I wanna do the similar things in my broker. So I just rewrote the similar things right here in my editor and that's it. So once I finish writing the logic, what I can do now is I can go ahead and then do the RPK transform build. So what this does, it's going to start building the, um, the WebAssembly binary for me. So this binary is a uh, is 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 understandable on top of any WASI um, interface, right? So you can actually deploy that into our broker. So which while we're waiting for that to happen, what's going to what's going to happen? Uh, let's take a look at what we've done so far. Where is my thing? So what I did is I um. What I did is I created this data transform and now it compiles into this binary. And next step is to deploy this binary into all the brokers, right? And telling the broker to read from the raw data and then send it into another topic, which is going to be the model data that will be read from our um, from our uh, real-time machine learning predictions, right? So what I'm doing here now is I am going to go ahead and then do the deploy which I have the code here in case of any typos, which I have now deployed it into the broker. So if we do RPK, transform list, can't type today, can I? So I have a data that goes, that reads from a uh, raw data and then does the transformations and then sends it to the model data. So if we look at, so let's go ahead and then go to the model. Delivery model. And do the Python 3. Let's, let's go ahead and simulate the um, all the inputs coming from all these devices, right? So let's go back and do the producer again. We can now, if we go back now to you know, the model data, it is going to then have all this data ready. So we've got the age of the driver, the ratings, and then the destination, the three most important thing that we need to generate the models. Now we're ready to start training our models. And this is the code you've, you've been waiting for, nothing magical, but this is just to, you know, get a get your data coming out from Kafka. So this is a Kafka that also works with Red Panda that reads directly from my bro uh, from my brokers and then stream, in stream these data and then send them to start training. So I'm going to kick that off. And what this does is going to then start reading from all this new information that I have, I'm generating and then start feeding that to the model and then start training the models right away. And once it's trained, it is going to then deploy these applications into the, um, in, uh, deploy this model into my applications so I can do real-time predictions. And it's going to take a minute or two for it to generate the models. Um, I, and I hope you find today's uh, sessions useful. And uh, if you have any questions, I actually, this is a lab that I created. So for those of you who wants to you know, redo this lab, reach out to me on LinkedIn or Slack or um, just, uh, so, or email me, Christina at redpanda.com. Um, I can share this lab with you so you can run it on, uh, on your own as well. So after it's doing the, the training, now it's doing the testing, you can actually run this um, by yourself as well. I'm happy for you to share this with you but this is what happens. So this is a very simple application that I wrote that just loops in the model. 
so that you, I can use that model to do some kind of predictions. So now I think it's just waiting for the uh, the models to run. So uh, let me just we run that again so I can now provide the age of the driver and maybe let's give it a four rating distance. Let's go to 40 kilometers. And then I get a real time predictions of how long. So it looks like it's gonna take about 30 minutes for me to get the, uh, the food. So that concludes my uh, session today. And before we go, um, here's a quick question for you to let me know about uh, yourself. Where are you in your data streaming adoption? Love to see where are you, are you actually using? And I love to hear that from, from you directly. Um, let me know, are you using that for AI already? Or are you just thinking about it um, or it's already incorporated in your, in your world? Perfect. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. Um, do we have any Q and A. I can share with you on this notebook. Um, I can share with you. Just reach out, reach out to me on LinkedIn. I will um, send you this particular robot. So there is a question coming up. So what is Red Panda's roadmap in AI space? So I think you probably was asking this question because we just announced Sovereign AI yesterday from Red Panda. We announced it yesterday. This is coming, I think, the best timing ever. Um, so I think we're just thinking about, you know, where does people going to use AI and streaming data in the future, right? So in Red Panda's world, what we've been, I don't know if you heard the news, but we've acquired um, uh, this new cool project called Benthos, which allows us to do very efficient, uh, very similar to Kafka Connect Connector. And we're building AI enable connectors in there, meaning that you can actually use use the um, the connector to connect directly to any LLMs out there or internally in your local machines, right? So I think now the LLMs is so mature that there's no, it's really hard to actually go one, go ahead and faster. So um, it's the way that allows people to quickly adopt those LLMs. These are the, the new trends. Like how do we get developers? How do we enable developers to quickly get their hands on LLMs and how do they get, get them faster to use these kind of capabilities? And I think those connectors will allow you to do that. So basically it's like, it's, you can use the collaborative in declarative ways. So you can have multiple YAML files, um, you, you say YAML files and then configure them as one single components and they will talk directly to the LLMs that you have. So yeah. And, and there's another question for Lipe it says, if I got it right, you deploy a trained model at the brokers. So in my case, I didn't deploy my training models in the brokers. The training models was deployed, um, it was deployed in the uh in the uh, in my machines, right? But 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 I think you asked the right question because that's where we're going in the future. I'm deploying my I'm deploying my transformation logic in the broker. So if you see, if you saw the example I did, I actually wrote the Golang to actually do the processing. But in the future, the new sovereign AI, we are going to let you deploy a small, efficient, much more smaller model. Of course, if you're not running into the edge devices, it's not gonna be like super like powerful, right? So you're gonna you, we allow you to do that, to load that into the broker so you can have that model running your brokers very efficiently. All right, so one is asking a questions about what database do you work with? Um, I don't have any database right here, surprisingly, right? So I'm just straight up using a streaming a streaming framework, Red Panda, to connect directly, stream this information directly into my model training. So you're getting the latest and greatest information to train your data instead of you know host having everything stored in a database and then getting it out of the data pipeline. And I, okay, so there's another question from Ravi. What is the impact of WASM execution cost on a broker? Would that impact the resource requirement for the current brokers? That is a great question. Um, so WASM execution is going to, yes, take up some costs 
it's going to use some of the hardware resource. So you want to be careful. If you have a very fully loaded broker already, you don't want to add that execution in there. Because the reason why we use this is because we've seen a lot of broker that was, you know, very, uh, it was it was not even using up to its 20-ish percent of the performance is the thing, right? But another thing that we allow you to do is that we can allow you to isolate, you know, percentage of your workload. Say if you want to, you know, only provide 20% of your workload for your WASM ex executions, we allow you to do that. So there is a way you can segregate your workload on top of your broker. I think we're up at time because uh, I know there's more questions coming in, but I think that's all the time we have for uh for the q and a's but thank you very much for uh coming over and if you have any more questions feel free to reach out to me on my linkedin or on slack communities that we have i'm super happy to be here i hope you find this information uh, this session useful and i will see you another time i'll hand it over to candace Thank you so much, Christina, for your time today, and thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.